it's tough to be a, a conservationist in, in our world today. Um, there's a lot of things to that. There are a lot of things that can depress you, but um, yeah, finding the silver lining though, I think, is what keeps us all together. <laughs> You have to identify people with the whole uh, protection effort. And why are we doing this? Well, for example, uh, when we are uh, um, uh, establishing sand dunes, sand dunes is the second line of protection, of natural protection against erosion. The sand dunes. The sand dunes are outside. So, more people get involved with the sandals, much more people than with the coral reefs, see? And that's all the logic of the world. Discovery, mystery. Fish amassed by the thousands in shimmering spirals. Waves unsettle the surface, an endless nebula beneath withholding its secrets. The ocean makes up 71% of our planet. But what do we know of it? We know that it sustains our lives. But for many, the ocean serenity is unknown. The challenge of breaching it, intimidating. First of all, our, our uh, NGO uh, nonprofit uh, organization's name is Arrecifes Pro Ciudad. That means reefs pro city. The reefs protect the city. If we didn't have those reefs out there, we wouldn't have any sand beaches uh, here to enjoy. So that's the first thing. Second. It, it is the first line of defense against the waves and erosion. So that's the first line of defense that we have, natural line of defense, and that protects our life and our properties. So it's very fundamental that those reefs are healthy. Uh, even if you don't care about the corals or the fish, just care about your property and think about that. It's, it's gonna be much better, more, much, more secure if those reefs are healthy because they're gonna keep growing and the defense is gonna be bigger. Our world is a net, one in which we are all connected by its strings. We are bound to the ocean and it to us. Cut one of these strings and the net no longer functions. Well, okay, I'll make this really specific. So say um, someone here locally came to me and said, you know, I, I don't see the benefit or I don't understand why it's important to protect coral reefs. I would bring them down here to this marine reserve and I would show them essentially this area and how we still have our coastline in front of the marine reserve after Hurricane Maria. So I would explain to them that these corals are the reason that we don't have exceptional erosion in this area. It's why we still have our shoreline here. And then I would take them to another part of Rincon that doesn't have a coral reef, and I would show them the buildings that are now dilapidated and falling into the water. And I would show them that this is why this is happening because you don't have a reef out in front of this area. There was one at one point, but not like this. And so I think being able to show people like, like hands on, this is what will happen if we don't have these structures is a um, probably the most impactful way to demonstrate to someone the importance of, of coral reefs. I mean, because you think of it only being as like a resource that you benefit from if you're in the water, but really, I mean, and it's easier to think about in terms of 
if you live on the coast, like in Florida, or if you live here on an island, like these structures are what keeps this land in place. <laughs> Coral reefs are vital to our planet's sustainability and to many who live in proximity to them. However, there are a myriad of factors, new and old, that are damaging and destroying our reefs. While some of these factors, referred to as stressors, remain low impact, there are those that demand awareness. There are several stressors that really impact coral reefs. Uh, aside from some of the ones that we know a little bit more about that have kind of made it into the news, such as our, our warming ocean temperatures and our more acidic ocean temperatures, those kinds of things cause a lot of stress on corals. Um, they cause corals to bleach, which is a term when essentially they lose all of their color and they become completely white, which is exposing their underlying skeleton. Um, since a coral is actually a soft-bodied animal that lives within a hard skeleton. So what happens when ocean temperatures get really warm is those corals become stressed and they actually expel this symbiotic algae that lives within the coral and that's why we end up seeing them turn this white color. Typically corals can overcome that if the warming event is short-lived. However, if it goes on and on for a while, then those corals don't have that chance to recover and they will essentially die after that. These are an urban place. We have uh, buildings all over the place. So uh, water sheds, um, sanitary overflows that end up in the, uh, uh, in the reef. If the water is contaminated, it's gonna kill the, the coral. I mean, all right, so some of the, the, the bigger threats to coral reefs are gonna be coastal development. That's huge. Um, people building like right along the coastline where reefs are, because with that comes sedimentation, comes, you know, fertilizers, pesticides, sewage, all making its way into the ocean. And that causes a lot of things in the coral, for example, and more nutrients, uh, there's more alga that covers the coral, covers the sea grasses, and that's a, a big problem that we have with the sanitary overflows. And then our latest stressor is the stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, it's a disease that will essentially wipe out a coral colony and even a small reef in a matter of days to weeks to sometimes a month. Those diseases are very likely coming into the ocean from you know, the, the terrestrial areas adjacent to those reefs. So those corals haven't evolved to handle those stressors. Um, and that's wiping out our reefs. So any coral tissue loss is taking away even the tiny percentage of living coral that Florida still has and is do, trying to do the same thing to our reefs here. So when that does impact a reef and then it damages it and the coral doesn't survive, then essentially that just becomes a calcium carbonate skeleton or kind of like a rock. And then what we have is a, um, a reef that's, that's no longer, uh, it's no longer vibrant, it's no longer diverse. It's essentially been uh, diluted down in its biodiversity. And once that living coral is gone, those fish will also leave. With our ever warming climate and the regular appearance of new stressors such as the stony coral tissue loss disease, the Alcon coral seems bleak. However, there's potential to limit and eventually control these stressors. It's tricky. It's there's not just it's not black or white of how to go about dealing with these things. It's kind of trial and error. I mean, a lot of times we can't even be proactive about this. We have to be retroactive and like treat it once we see it. We're working on uh, with with uh, applying the uh, the antibiotic, and uh, it's working on seeing some colonies. But there are ways to be proactive about it, and that's you know things like making sure that our sewage systems are up to date so that they're not draining and leaking into the ocean. Um, you know, not using fertilizers and pesticides if your homes are really close to the to the ocean, or if you live in a watershed that drains into the ocean. restoration is actually, it's a fairly simple process just in terms of like the physicality of it. Um, but there's a lot that goes on underwater before we actually plant a coral. So 
When we're underwater, we have to look for an area of the reef that is relatively devoid of other species that the coral might uh, compete with. And then what we do is we take a bucket of hydraulic cement underwater and we scoop up about a handful of the cement. Of course, it depends on the size of the reef fragment. So then we'll take that scoop of cement, we put it on that area that we've just cleaned and we put the fragment on top of it and that's it. We essentially just place it so that we know it's secure and then step away from it, swim away from it. Well, unfortunately, just transplanting corals is not, um, like that's not a viable way to go about this. Um, and we can't look at it that way. Like we can't approach this as, well, I mean, we've got technology, we'll just plant more corals and make everything come back. Like it's, that's just not how it works. In fact, most coral restoration projects are doing good to have 50% success. The best way to approach this is to be you know, more proactive in how we live our lives, like being more sustainable in how we treat our garbage and our sewage and, you know, how we treat what we do when we get into the water. So, you know, not just throwing your anchor down onto the reef to, you know, that's gonna break hundreds of years of growth that uh, isn't just easily fixed. <laughs> Even if we know how we can proactively save our coral reefs, we now have to tackle the issues of awareness and involvement. One way for the community to join together and undertake the challenge of protecting our reefs is through the creation and support of marine reserves. The main problem that we have uh, when we are on the water and uh, protecting reefs and, uh, is that the whole, the big majority of the people have not even gone into the water, under the water, I've seen what we're seeing every day or whenever we go underwater. Uh, they don't have the same information. But if you know that the law tells you, hey, you, you can do something because there is a law that, that's protecting this area, and then you see the results because you call the police and they come, the, the neighbors, the neighbors that live here, they understand that, that they can do something to protect it. Okay, so behind me we have the Trace Palmas Marine Reserve. This was actually started by just our organizations, our neighbors, our communities here in this town that saw the value in the coral that we have out here and the reef structure that we have out here and sought to protect it. It's very important to have a marine reserve uh, designated by law. It is. <laughs> essentially just come and enjoy it and, and, and leave it as pristine as you found it. I think that there, with the whole climate change uh, uh, education and all this climate change uh, thing going on, people are getting more and more conscious about what's going on in the water. That is a, certainly a motivating feeling to keep doing what we're doing. And usually, you know, coming to talk to someone like in our position that is doing this for a living, we're super stoked to get to tell people why we love doing this. Um, because we want to be able to share that perspective. And the experience of anyone seeing a sea turtle underwater, uh, that's, that's something that will mark you forever and that will identify, uh, help you uh, to identify with the system, with the marine system, and that's what we, we need. We need that. As a kid, I used to live out by a lake With lightning bolts, collecting sticks and secret handshakes I was invincible then, my heart so pure I had no fear, and those were the years that I hold so dear.